It's only 30 years of Alliance supporting the leagues, and we're not done yet. Only the leagues, only the Alliance leagues. Well, there is plenty of excitement in the Alliance Leagues over the next couple of weeks as the football and hurling reaches its conclusion. There is one round of football action left, and there is plenty of promotion and relegation drama to be played out next weekend. While in the hurling, we have reached the knockout stages. Kilkenny play Cork, and Wexford play Waterford in the semi-finals. Welcome to the Throne Podcast. Will Slattery here with Michael Verney, as always. We're going to have Philly McGowan on to discuss all the football action in a couple of minutes and John Milan in the second half of the show. But, Michael, first, we might quickly touch on some of the, the football in Division 2, 3, and 4 because there's plenty of drama to look forward to next weekend. We'll start with Division 2. Galway have confirmed the promotion after a very impressive win over Derry. Ross Common will probably join them, but it, it, it's arguably the other end of the table with, with the most drama. York County awfully hosting Cork in, in what amounts to a relegation playoff next weekend. Yeah, to be honest with you, Will, um, I be, would have been happy enough. I would have taken your hand off to be in this position going into the last game to have, you know, to get a result to stay up because I, I thought we were going to be under pressure. And listen, we have been under pressure against the likes of Galway and Ross Common, but it's a huge game in Tullamore next weekend. And, you know, Cork are very hit and miss at the moment. And even though, uh, even though Cotton O'Matney is back, who's, you know, one of their really good forwards, has played very little league action yet and was very good at the weekend against Down. I'd still be fancying our chances in that game. And that's obviously the trap door of the Tolton Cup as well. Um, the, the winners will keep Division 2 football for next year and they'll play, in the, uh, they'll play for the Sam Maguire, whereas the lo- losers, so much, uh, it's so much of a, it's a real sucker punch going into the championship. You've Division 3 football for next year, which is not you know as nearly as appetising prospect as Division 2, and you have the Tolton Cup as well. So uh, that's a massive, massive game. And just, uh, you mentioned Galway there. Have to say, I was massively surprised that that they blitzed Derry the way they did, particularly in the first half the other day. Um, and in discipline, probably cost in Derry in recent weeks. Uh, Shane McGuigan sent off last week, so he was missing for that game, and did a couple of a couple of dismissals at the weekend again. So they're going to have to get results to go their way. I think Ross Common go to Galway. Um, Galway would it's like an interesting like they're obviously massive Connacht rivals. I'm sure Galway would love to deny Ross Common their place in Division One, but they have an awful lot less to play for than Ross Common. Ross Common have Division One football to play for. Galway, I, I'd imagine, would uh, would run their squad and give guys that haven't played that much a bit of action. But Division Two has been brilliant. There's even the possibility of Clare being relegated depending on results as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's come down to the conclusion that you would have really wanted, especially with the Talchin Cup in play as well. Yeah, and Ross Common, I think, are the ultimate yo-yo team. I think they've gone up and down from Division 1 to Division 2 for the last six, seven years almost. So, uh, as you say, they play Galway in their last game and with Galway potentially with one eye on a league final, as well as a tough game against Mayo early on in the championship, as you mentioned, they might be more inclined to run their squad. Yeah, without a doubt, yeah. Like, you have to kind of see the bigger picture as well. They're going to, they're going to pout their best 15 for that league final. And I think this weekend will be not an inconsequence, but they'll definitely be looking towards the bigger picture. And then just on, on division three as well, it's, it's gas. I was at leash and loud, uh, the first game of division three this year. And I just did not see loud turning it around as well as they have. Leash are in relegation trouble and loud are in, you know, look like they've one foot in division two, which would be an incredible story from Mickey Hart's point of view and Gavin Devlin coming in there, division four to division three, potentially to division two. Um, and just on, on Sam Mulroy as well, we probably don't see that much of him because it's just away from the higher tiers. He's accounted for 54% of loud scores. So seven points the first game, one, three, eight points, 10 points, one, six, one nine, like he is just everything goes through him, and he was brilliant again at the weekend. Um, and then on the flip side of that, there was a fair bit of controversy in the Fermanagh Westmead game. Definitely looked like Sean Quigley kicked a legitimate point that didn't even look like it crept inside the post. Looked like it went over the black spot nearly. Was way of why that game ended up in a draw, and you know, just you know, there was a fair bit of tension on the field then after. Uh, things just kind of boiled over a bit um, and you can you, you, that's to be expected when you feel like a call has gone against you but Fermanagh probably should have been winning that game and should have been up near the top end of Division 3 whereas now they're around the middle of the table but uh, lots of uh, lots of controversy and different things going on in the lower tiers Yeah and Loud and Limerick I think can book their place in Division 2 with victories this weekend as you mentioned the Talchin Cup implications there that means if they were to lose uh, 
before the provincial final, they'll go into the qualifiers. But Westmead and Antrim are, are well poised as well. If one of those two teams does slip up, they could go up as well. So lots of play for Division Three. Division Four, I suppose, is a little more straightforward. Cavan and Tipperary, after you know their fall from grace following their provincial heroics a couple of years ago, if they both win. I think they're both at home this weekend to uh, London and, and Waterford. They'll go up to Division 3, which is where they belong. They don't belong in Division 4. They were kind of the outliers they looked like at the start of the campaign. Ah, uh, yeah, they would. you would have definitely uh, looked at, at, at Cavan and Tip and thought these are definitely promo- heavy promotion favourites. And Tipperary had a couple of pretty bad results at the start. I think Leitrim came to, to Semple Stadium and beat them seven or eight points. Um, interesting next weekend, Tipperary are slated to play London on Saturday night. Which uh, I was chatting to the London manager Michael Matter about this. It's very tricky for them with regards to getting planes back over to London and things like that. So they have to play games at peculiar times. I know they played Leitrim at twelve o'clock in the day because the last flight back from Knock to Dublin was five o'clock. But that game is Saturday, and the other games are on Sunday. It's the only game at the moment that's not been played at the, at the same time as the other games in the division. So that's kind of a peculiar one. You know, a lot of teams could play on Sunday and know their fate already. Whereas they should all be playing at the same time, which just leaves no uh, possibility for any funny business or anything like that. And it's an equal standing for everyone. So it's going to be interesting to see if that game is changed. And all the other games are fixed for one o'clock in Division 4 on Sunday. So it'll be interesting to see if that game is switched or not. Yeah, we're going to bring in Philly McMahon in just a minute to discuss Dublin's win over Donegal and the lay of the land in Division 1 generally. But first, Michael, I know in the hurling you wanted to give a shout-out to Rory O'Connor. I think he hit 112 against Cork. And what was a dead rubber, but still a very impressive uh, individual performance. Oh, unbelievable, Will. He he three different markers on him, and he's just the guy uh, that has always had huge potential, but throughout this league, he has lived up to it in spades. And he's not carrying Wexford on his back, far from it, but... In the absence of Lee Chin, he's just he's taken his game to another level. And I think it's hugely exciting for Wexford folk heading into the summer that this guy who who made his debut a couple of weeks, made his championship debut a couple of weeks after doing the leaving cert, he looks like he's ready to catch fire come summer. And if he does and Lee Chin comes back in and is able to, you know, offer what he has offered to them for the guts of the last last decade, it's hugely exciting. And you know, Wexford haven't won a league title, I think, since is it 1973-74, I think the last time they won a league. They'll definitely be going gung-ho uh, to do that over the next couple of weeks. And with him in the form that he's in, you'd give them a fair chance. Mm. Well, we're starting off with football this week on the Throwing Podcast in association with Allianz. And we're delighted to have former Dublin footballer Philly McMahon with us. Philly, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, guys, yeah. No, our pleasure. I'm sure you're probably a bit more pleased to be joining us this time after a Dublin win. It was a tough couple of weeks for them at the start of the league campaign. What, what have you made of their performances over the last two weekends in those victories? Like, Has there been a marked improvement for you in how they played? Uh, I think there's been a sense of calmness in my play now, you know. And, um, I think over the, the first four games, there's a bit of there was a learning, obviously, process to those games. What was what wasn't working and what what needed to be done. But then there was a bit of um, negative energy seeping in. I would think, in terms of the way they were playing and and certain habits, I was seeing that probably weren't good for the performance. But I think the last two games were starting to see more and more more and more positive habits, mm-hmm. uh, more and more control, more and more. Um, momentum and dictating of the, the way the game has flown and even when um, if you look at the first four games when a team kind of got a goal uh, we were struggling for scores if you look at the game against Donegal the weekend um, you know a good kind of mindset in a group is when you can see the goal and you can get the next score or you can see the point and you get the next point it's how you respond for me and they're shown, they've showed in the last two games that they can respond positively and Philly, one thing that I was really interested to see from this team after the, the tough couple of weeks was how some of the key guys in the team, Kieran Kenny, Brian Fennon, who've never really experienced tough times in many ways or, or defeats or a run of defeats, how they react. Because it's not as if they have experience really to draw on from all member that year with Jim Gavin when we lost four matches in a row in the league and everyone were, was on our backs. Like, were, were you interested in that as well? Like how some of these guys would actually react to that adversity? Massively, I wanted to see... Um... Look, the, you know, we've heard we've heard so much of. There's uh, l- lots of reasons why this Dublin team were underperforming start of the league. How many of them are true? It's, 
unless you do a, a you know a study on them, you don't really know. But you could you could guess and you could you could perceive that you know the leaders that have moved on weren't replaced. Um, so I was you know I didn't answer that question. I wanted to see. I knew from from playing with most of this group that's there now uh, in the last couple of years of my career that there is leaders there. Uh, however. There was we want I wanted to see what that leadership was like when we were struggling because that's when you really see the leadership in, in a culture stepping up. And um sometimes when you're a leader and your team is underperforming, you'll go outside of your 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 remit and you'll probably do the things that will actually not help the performance. So um you'll see in loads of games when a team goes behind and you'll see a player or a leader in that you know, trying to do something or trying to overdo or trying to shoot when there was a, a pan goal or a pass. Those things are, are the little things that I think you're seeing now uh, work really well. You're seeing probably Brian Fenton. You're definitely seeing Kieran Kilkenny kind of pulling back and doing the job for the team and what their role is, you know. Um, you're seeing that in the last two games, definitely. The, the four games before that, out of, the, out of good, you can see that they were trying a little bit harder uh, maybe wasn't coming off as well, but you can see now that the lads, uh, the whole group is starting to find their roles. Individuals in that squad are starting to do their job right. You know, Scully is starting to move really well. He's starting to kick the ball inside. Um, Dean Rock has been really good. Just obviously, we need up front. We need to we need to be more clinical in terms of our goal chances. That's something Dublin had for for years when they were successful. Um, and winning all Ireland. So for me, there's still little bits that they can get better at, but there's a lot of positivity around the leadership now I'm seeing. Hmm. Michael, what's kind of stood out to you over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, just probably more uh, more energy, particularly coming out of defence. I know they would have been, seemed to be maybe a bit ponderous at times during the first couple of rounds. Definitely a lot more energy. Uh, I'd say as well, something what Philly said there, there's still that same patience, but there's almost... Uh, more belief in the patients that they are doing that they are actually doing the right things. Um, and even like just at the various stages of yesterday's game, Brian Fenton was like, uh, to me, I tell and him, him and probably Brian Howard as well, they were really looking to make things happen. You know, they were really looking to stretch defenders any chance they got. They were looking to take on their man. There was uh, maybe more of a belief, even individually and collectively, in what they were doing, um, taking on their men, trying to make things happen. And I thought they were playing to higher percentages with things that they were doing around the field as well. Uh, shooting from higher percentage areas. Um, there was always men running off the shoulder, maybe, that would have seen characteristically uh, in previous years. And listen, if you're going to fit, like, you want to be finishing the league probably a lot stronger than maybe you're starting it. Towards the end of the league, you're going into championship, you're bringing confidence, hopefully, into the summer. And that's it's like it's definitely starting to look a lot more like Dublin now. So I'd say they would have taken, and I know Philly wrote about this for a few weeks, that bit of short-term pain where you're trying to learn, you're trying to get new lads in, that's starting to look like it is uh, kind of settling in. The, the you know, team looks an awful lot more settled. They look like they're happy in what they're doing. And uh, even if they are relegated, they're still going to be in a decent place going into the championship. Yes, Philly. Like speaking of relegation, like w- would it be as bad as it might be perceived on the outside with, with, with the noise that would come with it? Like Mayo were relegated two years ago and still got to an All Ireland final. Like from, from your perspective, because Dublin could beat Monaghan, you know, finish with three wins in a row and still go down. Would it be a, a complete disaster, or or would there be an opportunity maybe to to even blow new players in the league again next year? All right. So what what would be the the pros and cons of it? Obviously, the 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 the, the negative side of it is that obviously. Dublin fans won't like to see that Dublin team is being relegated, which is normal. Any look, let's say any fans would, but uh, the big base that Dublin has, the fans would be unhappy with that, right? Um, what do you lose? The standard, um, like Division Two, was being brilliant this year, and you could say Galway and Roscommon are kind of the Division One teams um, they have been, and and probably the bottom maybe six, seven and eight in, in the last couple of years, if you were to do maybe an average ranking of them. So you're, you're kind of, yeah, you, you, but you're losing that competitiveness in the league campaign, which is massive going into the championship. So that's the big one for me. Um, it's out of our hands now in that they have to beat Monaghan regardless, but I, I'm sure if other results don't go their way, they will be relegated. And that will be, 
that won't re- really, really impact them this year um, because they'll hopefully add one. Hopefully, they'll get the performance against Monaghan, grow from the last two games, kick into the championship, and go in with a different perception that some of the Lilters at the top here, and they are, by the way, because Tyrone are at the top, Mayor at the top. Uh, because Tyrone won it last year, obviously Mayo at the top and Kerry are at the top because they performed so well in the league this year. So, um, and then you've got others that are kind of poaching around that. Look at Armagh have had a good championship. Um, you could say Dunny, uh, Kildare have had a decent championship in Division One as well. So, uh, th- that's the, that's what you want. You want to play Division One football ultimately, and you want to be you know, you you want to be kind of you know, going to win the league in Division 1 so that you're playing so much football. That extra game or extra two games, semi-final and final, is key. Like, you know, that way when, when we were playing them, that we weren't out running. We were out playing matches instead. So those are the little things. But the overall, yeah, it will feel like the, the world has ended as a Dublin fan if we get relegated. Um, next year then, you know, you're, you'd like to think that you would be standard wise you'd be a bit above division two and, and that's not being disrespectful to anybody but as I said Ross Common and Galway I would I would I would respect that they're division one teams. If there was a if there was a ninth and tenth spot you'd have them in it. Um and they're obviously leading division two now at the minute. So um yeah look at I, I just think there's 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 so much from the outside it would look so bad from the inside It'll be you'll have to you'll have to be it'll have to be what it'll be like you just have to deal with it. It's, there's nothing you can do if you win and you still go down. You've you've, you've been relegated off the first four games of the last three. Yeah, like Michael, I'm not saying it's a good thing to get relegated or anything like that, but just taking the Mayo example that I use, like they they fought with you know, and clawed their way to safety so many years in a row, and it was held up as such a big thing for them, and that's why they were so competitive come a championship. But then the year they did go down, they still had a really good championship, and it allowed James Warren to maybe use that rebuilding, you know, a little bit more and get those young guys in who now have been massive contributors. So, like, it's not maybe the end of the world, but as, as Philly says, Dublin fans will not be happy and there will be a lot of noise around it if it does come to pass. Yeah, I think if they can avoid it at all, they will. And I think like, I think Desi and Dublin fans will take enough learning from the four games. They don't want to spend their campaign in Division 2 learning. I think those four games is enough and it shows already. Uh, the last two games has definitely shown that they have learned quite a lot from the first, uh, the first half of the league. So, uh, I'm not saying it would be a disaster, but it, it it's avoidable at the moment. And I think they'll do everything they possibly can to avoid it. Unfortunately, it is out of their hands, but I do expect them to get, I would expect them now at this stage to get a result against Monaghan. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it did work out in their favour. But I think they've taken enough learning from the four games and seven games in Division 2 uh, is not what they want. They want to stay in Division 1. Imagine how those players that have cut their, you know, a lot of lads, new players that have cut their teeth in Division 1 this year, get another crack at Division 1 next year, having played seven games this year and gone through a championship campaign. I think that's what they'll want. Uh, I don't think they want a full league campaign in Division 2. And also, like, when was the last time was on, on Ireland was won outside of Division 1? Like, it's, you know, you're going back a long way to actually see Johnny that. Gall, well. I think, maybe. Yeah, so, like, that's, you know, the goods of a decade. So, they don't, I don't think they, they, they don't want that. For, for long-term learning, Division 1 is where it's at. So, I think they'll be doing everything they possibly can to avoid that. Yeah, Philly, just looking at the top of Division 1, Kerry booked their place in the final with, with their win over Armagh at the weekend. You know, you know, what's your kind of view on where Kerry are at at the moment? Obviously, so much talent from those underage teams over the last couple of years hasn't translated yet to an All-Ireland. Like, from your perspective, when you were both in Dublin and now watching them as a pundit, like, what, what, what do you make of where they're at? Why have they fallen short, do you think, the last couple of years? Well, they're, they're obviously, they're, they're in pole position at the minute. Um, they have been throughout the whole campaign. And um, like the, the key thing for me is that, you know, obviously the, the power of a new manager coming in, a new manager that is, is highly respected down there as well. But you, you can see initially the energy that he's brought. Um, you, you can see the rotation he's had. Look, I mean, wasn't, uh, was the, I think it was not last, the last, was it the Mayo game? I think it was the Mayo game, Mayo and Kerry, you had, uh, why you had uh, Paul Morphy, you had Sean O'Shea, and maybe David Moran sitting in the stand, you know, and you're kind of going, Jesus, they're like four really big players, and they, they done really well against Mayo. But the big thing about Kerry is right now, what Kerry doing well is they're, they're basically paying free rent in everybody else's head. 
you know everybody's thinking of Kerry and that's 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 well, that's why it's very important to be in pole position because everybody thinks of you whereas you're thinking of your own standards and beating yourself and getting after that side of things so you're already um, a step ahead of everybody when you're in pole position um so and where I'm getting at is I remember playing when I first got on the Dublin team in 2008, Kerry wasn't... Like, I seen Kerry beat in Dublin. I seen Tyrone beat in Dublin. And the players that played those years um, that were getting the beatings by those teams had those scars. I didn't have those scars. I was a young lad coming in. I didn't experience those beatings. But I remember playing in 2010 and we had went... Look, again... I was playing against Kerry. I could see fellas around me a bit nervous. And I was kind of like, I don't really care about these. Like, you know, I'm just going to play football. But I remember playing Cork that year. And Cork were a big, strong, powerful, running type style team. And they blitzed us down in, in, in Cork. And I remember coming into the championship thinking, these are the team that we have to be. Not Kerry. Not any of our teams. That was the team. So that's the message you can send in the mindset and the psyche of players that you that, and the teams that you're playing against when you're performing so well in the league. So for me, then it's it's the separation then, isn't it? Really, like so, carrier at the, the the top of the, the pole position. Do they keep going that way, or do teams eventually catch them when it comes to championship? That's the key thing for me, and that's that's where I feel they've been. That's where they've they've been caught. Obviously, last year was a bit of an outlier. They had a you could question um, their complacency. You could, and you actually, you could put, you could question that the previous year as well you could, you could, against Cork. So, um, can they get that much of a separation that when they're a little bit complacent that they still get over the line? I think for me is is key. But um, yeah, I think Tyrone played it smartly uh, last year against Kerry. I think Cork played it smartly the year before. So you have to be your game IQ and your strategy against Kerry has to be has to be on the money to to beat. Just a quick one, Philly. Uh, something you said there about living rent free, and it immediately came to my mind that I think you were living rent free in people's heads for about the guts of a decade. And was that something that you were aware of uh, when you when you were playing ball? Like it was all about, you know, any player that was interviewed is, you know, how far are Dublin ahead? What can you do to, you know, make inroads in Dublin? Is that something you were aware of? And in league games, was it a, you know, a a motivation for you. We need to, you know, keep the foot on these teams' throats. Like they don't think they can beat us at the moment. We need to keep their foot in the throat. Was that something that even was going around in your psyche? At the beginning, no, because we were kind of like, you know, we weren't. We weren't. Look at when we got to a stage where we were winning so much. Then it was kind of like, well, hold on, what else is this? What what else can we achieve? What can we get after here? Like you know, and then when we were consistent with that success, then it got to the stage where we were like. You know, like we didn't set out to do it. It was just the way it happens, wasn't it? Right? It's like everybody is going out to beat Man, United, Man City and Liverpool. You know, they're all thinking of those teams instead of going. You know, what what do we have to do? Like, what what's 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 air best here today? And is air best good enough to beat them? And if it's not, then we need to shift the bar. So for years, I would have felt that we would have had teams talk about us so much. We were we were in the media so much. We had so much footage on us. That everything was kind of dialed towards us and what we were doing. So your mindset, like we seen the Mayo being us last year, you're kind of going, is that all you've set out to do? Or are you actually going to try winning all Ireland? No, we didn't set out to win the all Ireland. We set out to do something much bigger than winning all Ireland, which meant we fell short and win the all Ireland. We won the all Ireland, fall short. Um, so for me, I just think. Um, Dublin will be going in differently this year and I think Kerry possibly may or up there at the minute but definitely Kerry uh, are, are paying the free rent in, in other counties heads so that's why it's important every game you play that you send a message we didn't send Dublin didn't send the message in the first four games Kerry have sent it in the, la, in the six games that they've played yeah, Michael, because it's interesting to that point Philly makes there. Even Jack O'Connor, after some of these tight kind of arm wrestle victories over our man Mayo, he's made a point that, oh, we haven't had those victories the last few years. When we have been in a fight, we've actually come out on the wrong side of a lot of them. So he's putting stock in it publicly anyway. 
big time, yeah. And how many times have you seen uh, with teams knocking on the door and maybe just ever so slightly falling short? And it's almost like uh, it's almost crippling your psyche a small bit. But they're obviously he's trying to build them up maybe a bit more. And the fact that they've won these tight games, he obviously feels it's important. Just a couple of things that I've seen from Kerry that you know definitely different in the last couple of years. Even Armagh breached uh, breached the defensive line a couple of times yesterday, and there was just an extra body or two back. And they were, you know, in you know really good positions where they were actually denying that shot on goal, maybe that would have been taken against Kerry in previous years. I don't know if that's Paddy Talley's influence or if it's Jack O'Connor's influence, but definitely looks like they're uh, defensively a little bit smarter, maybe than they had been in, in previous years. They're not, you know, they're not, um, they're not allowing as many shots on goal. They're not allowing. I don't think Kerry this year you're going to see, you know, a team, uh, you know, picking up the ball around the 65 in a, even in a counter attack and just slaloming through the centre of defence where you would have, would have seen in previous years. So that's something small. Um, but yeah, Jack is obviously placing quite a lot of stock on these narrow victories. Um, it remains to be seen whether whether there's going to be whether it'll actually be worth anything come summer. But it's, they're definitely doing some things maybe that they hadn't been doing in the last couple of years. Yeah, one thing I'd really love to get your you know really as a as a former cornerback is you know David Clifford and you know how tricky he is to contain. You know whenever he plays, he came off the bench at halftime yesterday. I think he got one two that ended up being the winning of the game. I'm not sure if you ever got to directly go up against him towards the end of your career, but, you know, when you look at him, like, well, what's the best way to defend him? Is there a way to properly contain him? Um, it's, so, for me, he's the one, the one that got away from me in terms of marking him in my career. I would love to mark him. I'm the type of player that asks the manager, can I mark certain players, you know? But he's definitely on my hit list. Um, how well I would have done against him is, is, is out there for, <laughs> I don't know, you know, but, like... Um, so, 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 you have to look at habits, and you look at David Clifford's habits, and and they change. Everybody changes, but I get, I'll give you a, the first kind of chance I probably got to mark him, possibly got to mark him, um, was three years ago, I think it was. Um, I think Johnny marked him, and um, the draw, the, the first draw game against Kerry. And uh, a twenty is it twenty nineteen lads of correct me if I'm wrong yeah twenty nineteen, and I'd been studying them all week and I've been studying I studied Europe players as well, but I've been looking at little habits and and one habit stuck out for me around his movement and um, I wish uh, I'll, I'll tell you as well what it was but I, if I was playing I wouldn't be telling you this. Um, what you'll see with, with Clifford is um, he loves a little bit of separation. Because he's quite tall, yeah, isn't he? Man, yeah. If you have to mark a tall guy, um, and you have to kind of stand, and he was, and he was about stand right beside him, and he was about to move off, and you could just get some sort of contact with him. It's harder then to get a second movement, right? So for anybody that's marking tall players, that would be the first thing I'd be saying. Get after. Can you stop his first run? And in fairness, in um, in that game, that first game against Cali twenty nineteen, um. What would happen is the ball would carry would be slow in transition and he'd come out around let's say the, the center forward position and he'd just slowly and slowly go out and he'd be like nearly dormant and 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 you'd look at the mayor johnny cooper was marking him at the time and he'd make you think that he's not new and he's dormant and, he, and as soon as the ball roughly comes across the 45 he's gone he's moving somewhere he's either peeling behind out in front moving diagonally um, and and the good thing about Clifford is like he's got that that's one of the habits that I would get after. Can I close the space? So he's had fellas that have marked him that have been tight. He's had fellas that have marked him that have been fast. He maybe hasn't had fellas mark him that have psychologically went after him. You know, and and and, and I'm not talking about you know, just fella verbally abusing them, like really, really checking them out and testing them. And um, I'm not sure, saying that's going to work. You've seen a glimpse of it and fallen into a trap against Tyrone where he got two yellows. But I don't think he's far for that again. But I do think he bites a little bit. And that'll probably change now since I've said that. <laughs> but I remember marking him, uh, sorry, marking... Um, Tommy Walsh in the league first league game last year and I was supposed to be marking mm -hmm. Clifford and if Walsh went in because we, he was a target man I'd pick him up instead 
So I picked up Walsh. But I remember saying to myself, right, get me job done, do me job, keep Walsh quiet. He'd linked the he'd linked the play in the all in the first game. He he is maybe his his handprint on maybe one two in that game when he came on. And we marked him then when he came on in the replay. So it was another kind of chance to get a get my hands on on Walsh and see what I could do. So that was my first job. The second job then was to see would would the fellow beside mm-hmm. me, boy, who, who was David Clifford. So I was having a few variables with him, and I'm sure Walsh was looking at me going, "You're marking me. Why are you talking to him? Like you know." But there was a little, <laughs> little bits where he bit. You know, you could say, oh, "Fair play to him standing back up to you." Blah blah blah. But he bit, and and that for me was something that I always wanted to test. Um, I would have definitely in the last two managements had conversations before games that I wanted to to to, to get a chance to mark him. But he's both forward, he's balanced. He, his, his movement in front and behind, loop balls. He kind of has the whole armory, like, you know? So, and the key thing is, for him, has he got the ball going in? Has he got the supply? And has he got the lads around him that will move to give him the space? And he has all of that. I think every cornerback in, in the country will be listening to this, I'd say, to get, to get a bit of an insight into uh, in, into how to mark David Clifford. So it'll be interesting to see over the course of the campaign if anyone gets the grips with them. But for the now, Philly, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you. Well, it's time to talk hurling on the Throne podcast in association with Ali Ensign. We're delighted to be joined by John Milan. As always, the hurling semi final lineup has been set. Kilkenny will take on Cork and Waterford will take on Wexford. And, John, we might start with really the big game of the weekend was Kilkenny versus Waterford. I know it was one in your column on Saturday that you said you were looking forward to potentially with championship implications further down the line. What did you make of it, Kilkenny, obviously coming out on top in the end? Yeah, I went up there yesterday with the, with the family. Uh, had to make the day. It was, it was big Waterford following up there. Probably, you probably couldn't see it from, from, the, from the TV, but the other stand was, was completely full. From a Waterford point of view, it was a, it was a strange game. Uh, look, when I've when I seen the team selection Thursday, I didn't really know what to expect. And I suppose, you know, given how good they were against Tipperary, given the personnel they were missing, I thought, right, yeah, they, they, they have a... They're still in, still in with a shout. And, and I thought for the first half, they were, they were, they were very good for, for, for large patches, patches of the match. In that first half, I thought they were thought they were dominant enough. Um, I thought that the goal before half time, that was probably a soft goal to give away. Probably could have prevented that goal. Uh, and then ultimately in the second half, you know, Kilkenny got the the second the second goal, another goal that that could have been uh, prevented. But I thought Kilkenny were 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 uh, were very good from a Waterford point of view. I think one aspect that was possibly disappointed in yesterday was that we didn't. We didn't feed Desi Hutchinson with enough ball. Uh, and I think it's probably one area maybe Liam Cal would probably look at in saying, well, look, lads, we're probably the best corner forward in the country inside and we were starving, starving him of ball. You know, he was living off a of scratch yesterday. Now, look, in saying that, I thought the marker, his marker was, was very good on him. Mikey Butler, he's, he's a big point for uh, big point for Kilkenny. So Paulick Welch was, was excellent the centre forward. We couldn't get, it, get tabs on him at, you know, from from the get go yesterday, he was he was moving all over the place, and um, just didn't seem to. No one seemed to know who who was picking him up, um, and he was probably, you know, a big part of why why Kilkenny won yesterday. So all in all, look, it was it was two goal deficit. Given who we were missing, given the personnel we were missing, uh, you know, it was it was a decent enough performance from Waterford. You know, considering that, you know, when you look at yesterday's team. You know, in contrast to last year's All Ireland semi final against Limerick, I think there was five five of only that team started in the All Ireland semi final last year. But the worry from a Warford point of view now, they kind of, you know, they go into they're in, they're in a league semi final now, and they're, they're what for three weeks away. <sighs> There's a bit of uncertainty about the team. Like we don't know. Like, like, Liam Cattle, his hands are probably tied behind his back. You know, Prunty was probably carrying injury. Caelan Lyons is carrying injury. Um, Barron is carrying injury but you know we don't really know who the two cornerbacks are going to be I think it's tied to Burke and we be centre back Caelan Lyons if he gets back in uh, comes back from injury will be the other wing back possibly Fagan Fagan will slip into the other wing back so possibly know who our half back line is uh, is, is going to be 
But I think what's, what's crucial this, this Sunday is that, you know, Waterford's opponents are Wexford. You know, they, they're probably starting 11, 12 of their starters every weekend. And, and I think it's crucial for Waterford that, you know, starting next week that they start to get 11 or 12 of their championship team uh, onto the field. And I'm not buying all this talk that, you know, Waterford, you know, they shouldn't go for the league. I mean, we're not a Kilkenny, we're not a Cork, we're not a Tipperary, we're not a, we're not a Limerick, where we, we're not a wash with trophies, we're not a wash with medals falling out of our back pocket. They're in a semi-final now. I can go for it. And I think the four teams that are left in it, you know, one of the four teams has, has to go and win it. There's one sure thing, Waterford's opponents next week. Wexford are going to go all out to win it. I would take a Kilkenny will, will go all, to, all out to win it. And I would be thinking that Cork home advantage by, by, a, by a home following will, will go all out to win it. So I think from a Waterford point of view, you know, I think they should go all out next weekend, get to a league final. And, you know, there's all this talk surrounding, you know, you know, if they get to the league final, they're out two weeks later. And, you know, if they were to lose the league final, lose another final. That's crap talk. Absolute crap talk. A league final is a league final. Get to a league final. I mean, they're in a great position next week. They're coming up against the, the farm team of the country who haven't been beaten this year, Wexford. Well, have a right crack off of Wexford and see where it takes you. And please, God, hopefully, maybe maybe get to a league final. And I'd much rather be in the four teams that are left in the league semi final. I'd much rather be getting another one or two games under our belt just before the championship rather than playing a couple of in house games or a couple, a couple of challenge games. And look, it's, it's misunfortunate that there's, a, that there's a two week gap, but you know, I think from a Waterford point of view, I think it's, it's crucial that you know, you get Caleb Lyons back into the team, possibly get Prunty back into the team, get a good few bodies back into the team. And I think, I think there's a bit of a common sense approach yesterday from, from Liam Cattle in regards resting Stephen Bennett, resting Patrick Curran, resting uh, Jack Pendergast. Resting Connor Gleason because you know they've played the bulk of the matches. So I think from Liam Cal's point of view, he's been very clever in how he's used the league and, and how he's used his panel. But now it's a semi final stage. I will be saying, you know what, lads, we're in the last four. This is a national competition. We've only won three national league titles in, in the history of Waterford Hurling. Let's go and win it. And you know, previous years. Any Waterford team that's won a National League, we won it in 2004, we pushed on and had a great summer. Uh, no, sorry, we won in 2007, pushed on and had a great summer. We won the National League in 2015, pushed on and had a great summer. Uh, and look, even if they were to lose it, now I know it's back 18 years ago, we lost the National League final in 2004. We were out a week later against Clare and we went and pulverised Clare by, by 20, 20, 23 points. So I just feel from a Waterford point of view, I think winning the National League would be fantastic for this group and I think it would it would kick them on to greater things in the summer, please, God. Yeah, Michael, what's your thoughts on, on that? You know, it's an interesting point. Like, it is such a short turnaround for the teams to get to a league final. Be, you know, I know Kilkenny, I think, play Westmead first up for, for the other three semi-finalists. Some bit, you know, Cork playing Limerick, you know, Waterford playing Tipperary, like there's some and Wexford playing Galway on, on the Saturday evening, even on, on the Easter weekend. Like they're, they're tough fixtures. So what way would you be approaching it? Like, would you always almost be happy to play a semi-final, you know, nail down some of your starting team and then maybe exit the competition and prepare for that uh, the opening championship game? I don't think either of the four that are left will will have that mentality because you know, Cork haven't, Cork haven't won anything since the one back-to-back Munster maybe four or five years ago. As John says, you know, there's a handful of Waterford lads that have won a league title in 2015 and they haven't won anything else playing for Waterford at senior level. Uh, Kilkenny, I think, there's not ensured and after winning the last two Leinsters and even winning the league in 2018, Brian Cody would love to push on again. I think they they were joint league winners last year as well. That's the, probably the one guarantee is that they will definitely go for it. But I do think the other three teams will go for it as well. We've been saying that Cork are not a, you know, not a kind of a winter slash spring team for the last God knows how long. Haven't won a league since 98. They'll definitely be going for it as well. I don't think there'll be, there'll be much case of any teams hanging back. Just from Watford's point of view, I think the league has worked out pretty well for Liam Cattle so far. He's got a load of new faces in. Uh, Mikey Kiley started a lot of games, wouldn't have started maybe uh, in previous years, only coming on the scene. Keen Wadding in, several other faces in, Jack Fagan in at wing back. They still have loads of players to come back. And that if they, you know, 
I'm sure plenty of them, the likes of Caleb Lyons, that potentially could come in for that semi-final. If they were to get to a final, they could potentially put a Jamie Barron back into the fray and he'd have a bit of game time before playing Munster. So I have to say, I think the four that are there will be going gung-ho to win it. And I, I don't see anybody holding them back. Um, and I think it's to be a massive momentum boost going into going into the provincial campaigns. The one thing you said about Kilkenny as well, and even with TJ Reid missing at the moment, they play Westmead and Leash in the first two games, which... Like to me, they're definitely. I think all four will be going for, it, but they're the one team that will be really looking to get to a league final, try and win it. They can nearly not taper back, but they will beat Westmead and they will beat Leash Baron. You know, massive upsets, and then they'll be ready to go again for round three at Leinster. But um, I think a national national title would be huge for either of the four, and I I just do not see any of them holding back at this stage. No way. Mm, and it will be interesting to see how they all approach it this weekend, as you say. Will they all go with their full teams? Will they will they kind of mix and match? John, of the teams that haven't progressed to the knockout stages, you know, they have a four week gap, most of them, to their championship opener. Like, which team is are you looking at in particular saying they have a lot of work to do? Like, which team do you think has the most they need to get right between now and the championship kickoff? Uh, I don't know, really. Well, what are we looking at? We're probably looking at Galway, Limerick, Clare, Tipperary. Look, possibly Limerick probably, you know, are probably out of the four, you know, probably don't need to get to a semi-final. But I think the other three, I think Tipperary, Galway, Clare, I think another game could have, you know, would have been beneficial to them. I think they wouldn't have turned their nose up and having, having another game, uh, finding out a bit more about, about their panel. Um, Gal- I was looking at the team sheets yesterday. You know, Galway seemed to, you know, Brian Cannon coming back. You know, Carl Mannion, uh, Connor Coney, Whelan, Nyland. You know, that seems to be probably five out of our six forwards. Um, their backs seem to be getting settled now. They've Morrissey, uh, Dottie Burke, and uh, Grealish, probably Fintan Burke, Porrick Mannion, and Darrell McInerney. So they are probably finding finding what, what, their, team, what their team is going to be. Uh, possibly, maybe, maybe Tipperary are probably... Still a bit unknown about about their about their starting fifteen. Now look, I know they put up a cricket score yesterday, but is that is that beneficial to them, you know, going forward, you know, coming down to Welsh Park in, 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 in three to four weeks? I don't know. Possibly out of those three to four teams, I'm sure they'll probably throw in a, a training camp along along the way, possibly this weekend or probably the week after. But yeah, I don't know. I still, I still think you know, from a Waterford, you know, Wexford, Carl Kilkenny point of view, I think another good, good game under our belts, uh, and look, see where it takes, and if that puts you into a league final, happy days. So yeah, for those, those two, those teams, you know, left out of the competition, out of out of those four teams. You know, maybe, possibly, maybe, maybe, maybe Tipperary, and then look, we've 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 the Dubs as well. Look, the Dubs, I think they kind of know, you know, what they're picking off. They're picking off of maybe 17, 18 players, and that was that was evident yesterday, where they were kind of went with the, with, with the same personnel. And I think the, the bit of a break will will will, will deal with them the world of good because you know they've been using the same 17, 18 players throughout the whole course of the league. So. Uh, yeah, it, for me, I, I would say possibly Tipperary, you know, are, are still a bit unknown in, 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 where, in where they want to go and uh, probably probably have probably have more question marks than, than answers hanging over. You know? Yeah, Michael, of those kind of cohort of teams, who, who's kind of catching your eye in terms of the preparation they need to kind of do between now and the championship opener? Well, Limerick is an interesting one where like the... You know, an easy enough win against Offaly yesterday. Funnily enough, like you wouldn't have thought going into that game, like Limerick had to win that game to avoid a relegation playoff. As strange as that sounds, it was never going to happen. But the league definitely hasn't panned out uh, as they would have liked it. Um, I think there's definitely a couple of positives for them. Mike Casey getting back on the pitch yesterday. I think he was there was a stand ovation when he came off the field after about an hour. He hasn't played in the guts of a couple of years. He was obviously the fullback in 2018. Having him back on board is huge. While the league didn't go well for them, you know, I don't think they've lost anybody through injury or anything like that. So they have a good three or four weeks. I believe they're going to Portugal, I think, on a training camp as well. I think it's the same weekend as the league final is scheduled. So 
they will expect to they will expect to learn an awful lot uh, and obviously the energy levels will be expected to go up an awful lot they're they're the ones really i think will when you look at the real ireland champions are going for three in a row they had a disappointing league campaign the amount of scoring chances they created was vastly down compared to previous years they're the ones like where you're really looking at these ads could improve 30 or 40 percent for the championship and they will be expected to but there is still that little bit of unknown we expect them to improve we expect them to be as good as they were last year but you can't just flick a switch either and there i don't know they'll maybe play a galway or play somebody in a, in a challenge game over the next couple of weeks somebody they're not going to meet in munster but it's not a given that they're going to be pitch perfect for the first round of munster and as john has said it before and he's written a couple things in his column you know if they go down to cork the first day and there's a you know you know, they don't get a win on the board or they don't get points on the board, then they're chasing their tail a small bit. So I think it's it's hugely fascinating. We expect a big bounce from Limerick in the next couple of weeks, but it's not guaranteed either. Yeah, and I think everyone struggled that game on Easter Sunday in Porky Keeve, hopefully a, a sunny Porky Keeve to, to kick the, the championship off. Um, John, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on the league structure in general, because I, I saw a lot of people this week maybe giving out about it a little bit. Obviously, you know, the football league at the moment, a lot of excitement about promotion and relegation. The way the hurling has been structured the last couple of years, it's kind of like, you know, they've split it into two, one A and one B, kind of evenly enough matched uh, sides of the draw, but it doesn't quite have maybe the same jeopardy as it did in a, a couple of years earlier. And I know with the uh, round robin championship so close, I think a, a lot of teams are maybe happy to have a, a lighter league campaign, but what's your, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, look, the danger was going into yesterday that there was probably possibly a lot of dead rubber games, and that that was the case. I suppose outside of you know Kilkenny and and Waterford, Kilkenny were, were, were had something to play for yesterday. You know, you had the relegation playoff. Limerick were always going to win that, and and yesterday down in down in Wexford and, and Cork, they were playing for you know who league stand and two, who was going to finish top, and you know Cork had the luxury then to be able to uh, rest a couple of players. I think the one thing is possibly the gap. You know, between the league and the championship, maybe going forward, they could push it out to possibly three weeks, which would, you know, attract more teams to possibly say, well, look, you know what, we're, we're going to go, we're going to go for the league. And, and possibly, you know, I don't know, maybe come up with some some formula where, you know, there's, there's, there's more to play for on, on the last the last day. Like, you know, I, I don't know that they go back to possibly have one, one league, whoever tops goes, goes straight to a semi final and then second place, third in the quarter final. So that 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 keeps 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 the show on the road, and um, keeps it all interesting going into the last day. And and I think yeah, maybe maybe restru- restructure the league, possibly bring back in the quarterfinals. But again, it's 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 more games, you know, that, that they probably could deal without before, uh, you know, the monster and the Leinster round robin kicks in. But uh, yeah, most certainly it possibly has to be looked at, you know, going forward for 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 twenty twenty three because uh, you know. It was disappointing yesterday that, you know, there was there was not not nothing, nothing to play for, um, and that was evident with, with uh, League Sunday last last night. You know, I think there was only about twenty twenty five minutes of, of of highlights. You know, in, in contrast to the football. Just on that, will as well. I do think it's important to say, like, the best part of the football season is the league. The best part of the hurling season is the summer. Like, we've a really good summer structure, really good provincial championships. Uh, you cannot, could not confidently call the Munster Championship who's going to finish one to five. You couldn't confidently call the Leinster Championship who's going to finish one to six. Whereas in the football championship, like you have a fair idea who's go- who's going to be where. Football, the league has always been, you know, for the last good while, the most competitive part of the football season. Where you actually, you don't, you know, they're playing against teams of equal standing. You don't know who's going to finish where. Whereas you know, the football championship really only gets going towards the quarterfinal and semi-final stage. That's just the way it's been for a while. So I think it's only natural with how attritional Leinster and Munster are with playing four or five games in the space of six weeks that the league, in, it is the league at the end of the day. You're basically trying to learn for championship, trying to uh, increase the, the depth of your squad for a championship. So I do think that's only natural. Whereas with the football, I do think there's an awful lot more to play for in the football league, but on a you know a converse point to that is like the football championship. There's a load of teams, even the second half of Division Two and and below them, who have very little to play with uh, for come summer. Hmm. Well, yeah, as John said, it'll be interesting to see if they look at that though going forward over the next year or two. But it's good to have some knockout hurling to look forward to in the near future. And for now, Michael, John, thanks so much for joining me. 
A lot of it. That's all we have time for in the throne this week in association with Allianz. We will be back next week with another show reviewing all the Allianz League action. In the meantime, you can subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or listen on independent.ie. So until next time, thanks for listening and goodbye. It's only 30 years of Allianz supporting the leagues and we're not done yet. Only the leagues, only the Allianz leagues.